You're listening to Change Your POV Podcast, episode 137. He's like, oh, you're a veteran, huh? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I got a fucking stupid haircut. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm still in. I'm still in the military. Right, I yeah. got this fucking fade. And um, he's like, all right, well, show me your cat card. And I was like, show me my, show me you, show me, show me you, my what? No, your cat card. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. All right, because we're in a public place now, and that costs extra. So, <laughs> uh, Right, yeah, so yeah. I, yeah, so I whip out my cat. Change Your POV is dedicated to helping veterans through transitions in their life. One way we do this is bring on guests to the show who have also experienced different transitions in their lives. I have yet to meet a veteran that had a smooth and flawless transition. And anyone that says they have, well, I wouldn't believe them. It is usually some of the most difficult and trying times in our lives. Divorce, separation, being angry, hungry, alone, scared, and without purpose are not anomalies, but instead, sadly, quite the norm. Our guest today is no different, but he found his way back. He found others, and he found his purpose again. Hope you enjoy. All right, hello, folks, and welcome to Change Your POV Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and I have a special guest for this Attack Friday. And for folks that are just joining the show, Attack is an acronym for us military folks. We love our acronyms. It stands for Actionable Tips, Tricks, and Coachable Knowledge this Friday. And Greg Jooms, who we're going to get into in a little bit here, has agreed to come on the show and help me facilitate this Attack Friday. But before we get into his story, I would like to have a quick shout out to this week's sponsor, Audible.com. Now, folks, if you've never heard of Audible.com, you're living in a cave somewhere, I guarantee it. Audible.com has over 180,000 titles to choose from with pretty much every genre under the sun, from health to novels, fiction, nonfiction. The list goes on and on. I'm an extreme avid audiobook listener. I love to educate myself. I don't really get into too much of the nonfiction genre. I like learning. I like self-help books. I like learning about social media, about uh, marketing content, um, how to better myself. I, I got a hour commute to and from work. So I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts and listening to audiobooks. And uh, And Greg, what are you listening to or have listened to recently that you just found extremely intuitive and important and, and would like to recommend to anyone listening? Uh, yeah. So um, I recently got into Audible because someone uh, turned me on to it because I hate, I hate reading. It's not that like I hate reading, but it just, it's hard for me to get attached and engaged in it. One, I think I'm too paranoid and I constantly, I don't want to be buried into a book. So I find audible um, audiobooks to be somewhat beneficial to me. Cause like you said, on your commute, you get to listen to something and you're still eyes on the road and you're taking it in and you can kind of rewind to hear the special parts that you wanted. But right now uh, I'm reading a book that pertains really very much to what I'm doing. And it's called platform revolution by Marshall Van Elsing, Jeffrey Parker, Sangit, Paul Chaudhry. It is a book on the inside look at the revolutionary business power of the platform. And as you'll, you know, your listeners are going to learn here in the near future about what my business is, and it is exactly a platform type business where we're connecting everybody together on the one central platform to make things easy and accessible to uh, to the users and also the customers. That's excellent. And for those that are might be curious as to what I'm listening to right now. I am listening to an excellent book that Bennett actually recommended to me. And when he first told me about the book, I was like, what? I, was, I thought he was kind of a little crazy. But the name of the book is called Hold On to Your Nuts by Wayne M. Levine. Again, Hold On to Your Nuts. And it's an incredible book. It's about basically learning how to be a better man. Um, nuts is an acronym for those of us that are in military that love our acronyms. And, uh, and you just have to check it out. So, uh, folks... Platform Revolution, hold on to your knucks, check them out, and you can head on over to changerpov.com forward slash free book, and you can sign up for your free 30-day trial and a free audio download. So download one of those books and start listening today. Now, let's get into Greg Joom's story. He's a veteran that is, well, we're going to get into your story about Victor App, your created or are creating a an, an app is it uh, ios and android or just ios for right now 
Um, right now, we are developing on both fronts because we feel that not everybody has iPhones and not everybody has Android phones, but there's a lot of both platforms out there. And a little bit of like my travels and, and my market research and just knowing people in general, not everybody has an iPhone. Mm. Everybody has a smartphone, whether it's on either platform. So we feel by allocating our funds to releases on both platforms will do the most good and allow us to create the platform to be a uh, force to be reckoned with, so to speak, instead of just kind of, oh, we want to help Android. Uh, not today, iPhone. That's kind of that's not going to help us grow. We want to kind of hit the ground running and get everybody on board at the same time. So it will be developed for both platforms, both iOS and Android. That's cool. And uh, I really want to get into what this thing does. But before that, talk to us about your military experience. Kind of like, when did you serve? Where did you serve? Like, what's that background look like? Yeah. So I, uh, I went into the, I signed up for the delayed entry program for the Marine Corps when I was 17. I actually had my recruiter come to my 17th birthday so he could have my parents sign the parental waivers so I could then enlist in the delayed entry program as a 17 year old high school kid that thought he knew everything. So, Um, so hold on. So an army, I'm sorry, a Marine recruiter went to your 17th birthday, right? Like blow out here, here, blow Uh out your candles and sign the dotted line, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I thought it was the coolest thing, right? And like looking back at it now, I'm like, fuck, man. Like my family members and like <laughs> my friends was like, dude, what the fuck? Like well, you couldn't have had like anybody else here. Like you couldn't have had a clown or a magician pull a fucking rabbit out of a hat. But you want this guy in dress blues who's like had probably gave no shit about like my birthday other than like, oh, I got my numbers for the month. Hell and I yeah. got this kid for fucking another That's year. That's like Great. a hardcore Marine Corps recruiter right there. Oh, yeah, dude. I was a lifer before I even went in. <laughs> and then I got in and I'm like, this is fun, That's but awesome. I can do better. Kudos to whoever you are. Do you remember the guy's name? Yeah, uh, he was uh, Gunnery Sergeant Corcoran. Um, great fucking Marine. I mean, he was Marine of the Year, recruiter of the year. He went up like two ranks and less than like 18 months. Him and I are friends on Facebook and nice. I still check in with him every once in a while because he was, he was a Marines Marine, like straight up real guy. Didn't give a shit that I was in high school. Still kind of, <laughs> you know, hates the shit out of me a little bit after, yeah, after school. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. He's making me do push ups till my arms fall off. And he's like, Oh, <laughs> all yeah, right. Well, Way to go well. gunny. That's yeah, awesome. right. All right. So yeah. So there you go. You get sucked in. You literally blow out yep. your 17th birthday candles. He rips you up by your, uh, but your trousers calls you boot, right? And then what? <laughs> yeah. um, so then I went to, uh, I graduated high school uh, in June of 2006. Had about a month off until I went to uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. Um, and that's when I started my 13 weeks of living hell. Um, I enlisted as an infantryman because I thought it'd be really cool to do all the fun stuff that, you know, nobody writes books on the guy that like refuels jets, right? Like, mm. <laughs> No one's like, oh, the supply clerk was so hard. It was awesome. It's like, okay, yeah, we need all those guys to, to, for, the, for the effort. But the movies are made from the guys that were stupid enough to go, oh, I want to go and hike 20 miles with 100 pounds of gear and yeah. destroy my body. And um, so, yeah, I signed up to be a rifleman because – actually, I signed up on a, a recon contract to be a reconnaissance man. Uh. And um, I was like, oh, this is going to be fucking awesome. It's kind of like – it's like SF, but it's like cool, sneaky squirrel stuff, whatever the recruiter sold me on. And I finally, you know, I get through boot camp and then I go to my uh, SOI, which is School of Infantry, to do my job schooling. And that's when I was there to do the, the Marine in-doc training or, you know, to qualify to go through the, the whole reconnaissance school. Uh-huh. And my buddy and I got there and we were both on the bus because we met in uh, School of Infantry. And we're like, you on the same contract? He's like, yeah, me too. I'm like, you really want to do this? He's like, no, I don't want to do this. I'm like, I don't want to do this either. <laughs> so... So, like, we're fucking asking, like, the gunny that's in charge, like, this, you know, stocky fucking SF salt dog. And we're like, hey, so how long um, are we going to be, like, when do we get to go deploy? We want to go to Iraq. And they're like, whoa, your BRC is going, it's going to be, like, a year, year and a half before you actually, like, get deployed. And we're like, no, the war is going to be over. <laughs> we just want to go now. So we got dropped back to our unit and um, ended up doing a six-month uh, training workup to go to al province. Iraq, which we operate right outside of Fallujah, uh-huh. and it was a pretty, pretty, you know, easy enough deployment as a grunt. We didn't take our company didn't take any uh, any KIA. We had a couple wounded, um, but all in all, it was a pretty, pretty good deployment. I and mean, what, at the time, what year was that? Uh, that was 2007 to 2008. Okay, we were operating outside of Fallujah, um, okay. and it was cool. Yeah. What was the uh, What was the primary threat at that time? Was it still IEDs? Yeah, IEDs. Um, we had a lot of uh, Willie Pete. We had white phosphorus in our AO, which was kind of fucking nasty. Um, uh, but, white, white, phosphor- white phosphorus yeah. IEDs? 
Yep. Oh, man. They had a, That's nasty. a lot of 155 millimeter um, arty white phosphorus rounds Jesus. that they were burying and, you know, on the, obviously on the side of the road and shit. Yeah. But th- they were not very, thankfully, I mean, they weren't very fucking accurate. Like they'd hit a, they'd hit a vehicle or whatever. And it's like, okay, well, these are, you know, the, the white phosphorus gas and everyone's like, you know, don't breathe it, don't breathe it. But nobody got burned. It's almost like they wanted to show that there was a threat there, but really didn't want to hurt anybody. Right. I don't know. I, I don't know. Probably conspiracy or something. I don't know. But <laughs> we all came home. A um, couple wounded, but other than that, it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and yeah. How, how long were you there for? Uh, about seven and a half months. Did okay. one combat deployment with the Marines um, and got out. Didn't have enough time to make the next deployment, so kind of stayed back while they went on their mew and then got out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the military side of things. Okay. So now, did you get out on your own volition? You're like, okay, yeah, I did my time. I'm done. Or was you? Yeah. So, so I got um, I got out with the anticipation. I made a couple of contacts while I was, you know, in the the last year or so of getting out, and I was like, all right, well, what the hell am I going to do? Um, and I had a wife and kid at the time, which was like, you know, as being a 20 year old at that state. Like, I got out when I was 21, but. I mean, you, your mind is going through so much at oh, that yeah. point of like, all right, I got to get a job or I got to stay in. Am I going to go to college? I didn't go to college because I went in the Marine Corps, but now I'm going to go to school, but that's not really for me. And, and it just, uh, yeah, it was like, I try to explain it to some people that have no comprehension of what it's like to be in the military. And people mm-hmm. talk about, like, I have friends like, oh, I have, an- I have anxiety. I'm like, oh, you have anxiety because what? <laughs> you had to wake up today and go to fucking work? Like, oh, you, somebody, <laughs> you, you, you didn't get a project done on time? Like, is anybody hitting you? Is anyone screaming at you? Right. You ever had to, like, worry about your entire life just being uprooted and changed? Yeah. No, no, because you, you still get to go home and do your wash at your mom and dad's house. Yep, exactly. What type um, of preparation did you do, if any, to prepare you to get out? I was kind of in a better, I was in a good position because I got out and... I, uh, I had already started establishing contacts within the uh, within my space, so to speak. I wanted to do high threat security contracting because, I mean, shit. We all knew about Blackwater and Triple Canopy and what they were doing and stuff. Um, it just uh, so so yeah. I knew what I wanted to do and I, I knew who to look for and who to look into. And uh, yeah, so I started doing my networking stuff with um, a lot of. Some, I met so, so all right. I met this guy at a gun show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, uh-huh. and I was looking to buy some ammo from him, and I asked him about a. Uh, a veteran discount. He's like, Oh, you're a veteran, huh? I'm like, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I got a fucking stupid haircut. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm still in, I'm still in the military. <laughs> right, I yeah. got this fucking fade. And, um, he's like, all right, well show me your cat card. And I was like, show me my, show me you, show me, show me you my what? <laughs> no, your cat card. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. All right. Cause we're in a public place now and that's cost extra. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, right. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. So I whip out my cat and I show him, uh, show him the card and he's like, okay, cool. What are you doing when you get out? I see you get out here in a couple months. I'm like, well, I really want to get into you know private security. Like that's cool. Like that's that's that next thing. Like all right, you did your time in the military. Now you have your prerequisites to go forth and do cool shit. So this guy coached me for the next you know couple months while I was getting out. And like here's how we, here's what you should look into. Here's the what you the kind of certs you need. And I'll plug you into this network. And what I ended up finding was it was a good push in the right direction, but it Nothing came from it. I mean, mm. this guy never landed me a gig. He never landed me a contract. It was a lot of it was a lot of hot air. It was oh, wait, wait, spin up. We got this thing going down in Haiti because we're doing direct disaster relief. And mm-hmm. I go out and buy a bunch of gear for this contract. And I'm like, oh, you got pulled. And it's like next one, I'm like oh, we're going down to Mexico City to do some cartel interdiction. And, you know, then that got, gets kinked. So I kind of gave up on that for a while. And I'm like, all right, this guy is just like, and you're at such a stage because now I'm now I'm out of the military and I'm like waiting for a contract and I don't have any money and. You know, I'm, I'm drinking too much and I'm getting into, you know, other substances because I'm just all fucking jacked up and I didn't have any direction. And it took a while, man. So, I mean, I got out in 2010 and I didn't I was not as prepared as I thought I was because mm-hmm. I put all my eggs into one basket. Because you because um, you met some dude at a gun show that still lived in the basement of his mom's house, like playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> Yeah, like you, I don't know, man. Like you I got screwed. Like, yeah, I got fucking gypped. But like, and he had. I looked. At, I did my due diligence as best as I could back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, you're um, like, you're like, like, he's legit. He asked me for my cat card. I mean, yeah, you know, you know who that cat is. Like, he's probably fucking. He probably parked his Blackhawk in the parking lot. Like, right. He's cool. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I get out and, and nothing like I ended up going from having these high expectations of being like this fucking like special operator contractor. And then I'm selling fucking used and new cars at a Toyota, Honda, Subaru, Mazda dealership. <laughs> oh, and, wow. Um, yeah, dude, I it ultimate like ultimate kick in the nuts. Yeah. And um I'll I'll touch on some of the things that, you know, veterans behind me and coming up can can really think about and look at as we get farther in the show, but it, it sucked, man. So it was about a year of me like at rock bottom, like working a stupid job. I ended up getting divorced, and my wife and son to Japan and was dating this older lady which was like single, no kids at thirty six was just like, okay. Some people that can work, but that's like a super red flag now that I'm like older. And it's like, oh, I should have saw that. And my dad's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. She's got big tits. Um, she's got a cat card, too. Yeah, she's got a cat card. It's bigger than mine. <laughs> but that's my own personal you know, fetish or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah hey, man, so, no, um, no, there's a judgment-free zone here, pal. Thank God. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, we'll do another show later, midnight show. There you go. Right. Um, late, late, late night show. Late, late night show. <laughs> Not the kind with Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I got out and it was really, really, really hard. And it was about a year of me like living on couches. And I moved out to Denver because I thought there'd be opportunities out there because my buddy from high school was living out there. And he's like, oh man, I can get you a sick job making 25 an hour. Like, don't worry about it. Packed my car up, moved out there. And I'm making like five, six dollars an hour valeting cars at a fucking hospital. Uh, and, um, yeah, my car was getting repossessed. Um, I couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't, I wasn't eating. I mean, I, I faint right. Like regular, like every couple of weeks because I just wasn't eating enough. And like right. people thought I was a diabetic. I'm like, I don't fucking think so. I just haven't eaten in a while. And they're like, your blood sugar is low. I'm like, it, thanks. Maybe I should be a fucking doctor. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's what happens. So at any point in that, yeah. in that story there, did you ever consider maybe going back in or was that just oh, off dude, the table? Yeah. No, no, no. I, I totally was like talking to some recruiters and, but to me like that, as hard as things were, that was, that was an easy button for me. Right. And of, of what I've done, that would have been a step back. It's like, all right, I got out. I've already been through fucking hell outside of the Marine Corps and now I'm just going to go back in. Mm, right. Like what the fuck did I just go through hell for to go back and go through hell again in the Marine Corps. Right. And then just um, inev- to inevitably get out again. Right. Yeah. And then <laughs> you're just delaying the inevitable. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. If you were to go back a little bit in time, what would you have done differently for the, for the listeners out there that are listening to the show that maybe they're, they're still in. Right. And they're not thinking about anything like that. Cause I, I did not, I did 10 years active duty, man. There wasn't a single day of my 10 years that I thought about what am I going to do when I got it? I mean, that just never for, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, that just never even crossed my mind. And now I look back and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, how could that have not been a priority on my list with a wife and two kids? How in the world was that not amongst the, the other bullshit things that I thought about on a daily basis? Why, why wasn't that one of them? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know, man, if I could have done it all differently, it would have been have a plan. Um, don't listen to everything that your senior leadership tells you because at the end of the day, like now that I look back on the, what people have said to me, what people have solicited me for life is a business, right? I mean, if you have an, some E eight or E nine telling you, you know, if you get out of the fucking core, you're not going to be anything but a piece of shit. It's like, Oh, because you stayed in for 20 years because you didn't know how not to yell at people to get paid. Right. And like after when I was contracting, which is nuts because I flipped everything around from going to being dead broke to making uh, 130 to 150 grand a year doing private security. And it wasn't just like uh, on a State Department contract. A lot of guys get out and they go on to WIPS, which is World Protective Service contract. It's mm-hmm. for the State Department. And it's like they get cool gear. They get to wear plaid shirts and like their Merrill boots and like khakis or whatever. And like that, that's cool. But that was too like mainstream for me. Like I wanted to be an individual. So I started working with a couple um, commercial security companies that didn't have, not always had uh, government clients, but commercial clients. And I got to sit in on these briefs with these command sergeant majors with, you know, um, ODA with the Green Berets, MARSOC and, you know, SEALs and stuff like that. And you get to see like, oh my God, these people are, they're, they're the high class operators, but you start to see some of the senior enlisted when I'm sitting in these intel briefs. And it's like, dude, whether you're SF, like the SF guys are shit hot, like hands down i've always the guys i've met besides one command sergeant major who didn't like me because of my hawaiian shirts i used to wear on post um 
they're all like it, it, it's scary, man. Because I've had guys on my team when I was 23, 24 years old, and these guys did like 22 years and retired as like a senior enlisted um, Marine, and they're like on my level, and they're like working for me, and it's like a hard it's hard for them to grasp because at the end of the day, like just like when I got out, I got kicked in the nuts big time. Cause I thought that life was going to be great. People are going to hand me a job. People are going to thank me for this. And like, they want to hire me. And, and that wasn't the case. Right. And you see these guys that stay in forever. And like, it was hard for me after doing it for four years. I can't imagine doing an entire career getting out and being like, Oh, you're entry level because you have no idea how the world works. Mm. You've been out for so long. I'll tell you what, man, you, you're, you hit the nail on the head, brother, because I talk to a lot of guys and I ask a lot of them the same questions. And it's the guys that have done 10 or more years. And the more years you, you do, the harder it is for a lot of these guys getting out. I just I had a, I went to a networking event and, and met this uh, lieutenant colonel retired after 22 years um, in the Army. And, you know, you're thinking 22 years, active duty, lieutenant colonel like oh five you're you know you got your shit together right i mean this dude was you should have some context oh my god and he's just like he's sitting there just listening to every word that i'm saying about you know how to be successful on the outside and in in different ways to look at things and approach things and, and tackle things and he's just like oh my god i never heard i never heard you know heard it put that way i've never heard anybody describe it that way we were talking about converting military experience into civilian terminology, not just converting it to civilian terminology, but converting it into language that civilians can not only understand, but find value in. Right. And he was like, yeah. Oh man, this is so like, you know, they don't teach this when you're getting out. And I was, I was <sighs> like, you know, and that's the thing I'm sitting here. I've talked to Sergeant majors. I've talked to like, we're talking upper level folks that in the military, they knew they were the, the cream of the crop, right? These guys knew what the hell they were doing. They wouldn't be in the positions that they were in if they didn't. But right. let me tell you, man, getting out into the quote unquote civilian or real world, that's the ultimate equalizer, isn't it? Yeah, big time, man. Big, big time. And then one of the, like that Lieutenant Colonel is saying, I, I preach to a lot of the vets I've talked to and, and even civilian, like you, you can see it in one of my presentations um, when, I, when I pitched that Technori uh, last month is the military works so fucking hard and they spend so much time and money into training you to be that most effective warfighter for whatever position that you signed up for. Right. Because it's a business. Yep. If I hire someone for my business and I start teaching them how to do other shit, well, now you're not going to be making me money doing the shit that I hired you for. Right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So the right. military is like, oh, hey, well, here's your two day taps class. And <laughs> right. The majority of the majority of the fucking kids that go through this are like, you know what, dude, I'm getting out. I got to sit here this PowerPoint bullshit for two days. All I want to do is smoke a joint and try banging that fat chick from high school and hope that she lost some weight. <laughs> right. Because like right. that's all they're concerned with. Yeah. And the military doesn't teach you how to do like there's so many skills that I started realizing after I got out that I'm like, oh, fuck, I can if I stop looking at it like here's my ceiling. Right. Like I have the military and like I can be this and this is as far as I can go because this is all I know I can do. But once you start realizing that the intelligence gathering that you learned as a fucking grunt yeah. or the logistics chain, the supply chain stuff that you did it, it, while working as a supply clerk, you can apply all of that. To either business, your fucking love life, your personal life, your professional life, everything has an ability to find new purpose. You just have to repurpose it. Right. Absolutely. And being in the military, you're extremely resourceful with things when they're giving you when someone gives you a task. Like your squad leader says, "Hey, this fucking pipe's broken. We don't have any other tools. What can you use to make sure that this doesn't leak?" Oh, you're going to take an MRE sleeve because it's thick plastic, and you're going to get some fucking riggers tape, and you're going to make sure there's a seal because you're resourceful because someone told you what to fix. Right. When, when you get out, no one says, hey, you need to fix this because it's literally you saying, holy shit, something's broken. But what's broken? Holy fuck, there's a bunch of stuff broken. And that's not broken. You just haven't you haven't re fucking fitted and resupplied yourself with a new set of ammunition. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what would be if you were to sum it up into one thing that you found to be the most challenging post-military, what would you say that thing would be? Finding purpose. Mm. Yeah, man. Finding your purpose, man. Because otherwise, you're just fucking, you're just patrolling, dude, with no fucking objective. You're just, all right, well, I'm just walking around. And like, yeah, you do census patrols and security patrols, but there's always a mission. But when right. you get out, you're just kind of wandering, like, oh, well, I can go to school. All right, so that's like the next thing, right? Because when you're, you, as you're growing up, you're ingrained in like, all right, you're doing kindergarten. Here you're in kindergarten. And maybe you're in elementary school, one through five. 
that's this. And then you're like, all right, I'm going to be able to middle school. And that's, you know, sixth grade through eighth grade. And you're like, all right, now I'm here. And now you're going to go high school. All right. It's freshman through senior year. Now I'm here. And then you go into college, which is four years, or you go in the military and do a single enlistment and that's four years. And it's like, all right, what's my next chapter? What's my next chapter? And for a lot of guys, they get out. The next chapter is just fucking the next 40 years, right? Yeah. 50 years. And that's terrifying. Yep. So terrifying. If you don't give yourself those short term goals and start, start finding other people that can mentor you. You had a squad leader, you had a fire team leader, you had a platoon sergeant, you had a platoon leader, and you had a chain of command. You need to identify those people within your network, whether they're digital, like remotely or within your community. Yeah, so let's stop there really quick or, or pause on that. I want to go back. Um, mm-hmm. And you talked about finding purpose, and you also talked about finding mentorship. So let's take each of those separately. Finding purpose, those that are listening to this right now, they may agree with you. But a lot of them are driving in their car, or working out at the gym right now, and they got this great big eyeball roll right in the back of their head. And they're like, great, I understand, I get it, but how, right? That's the ultimate question. Everybody understands finding purpose is difficult. How did you find your purpose? What was it? So it, it I was like, I was cruising on like autopilot for a while when I got out, when I was contracting, when I got out of contracting. And it wasn't until I expanded my network and literally listened to a panel of veteran entrepreneurs talking that were just like me. They're just like me. And I'm like, holy fuck, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can do exactly what those guys are doing. And then I talked to them. How did you do this? What made you find this? Why did you want to do this? And it was pretty unanimous. We found it's all through your network. Your network is your net worth. And that sounds super fucking cliche, but it's absolutely true because – it's like there's a reason, you know, if you're a saw gunner, you have 200 rounds of 556 five, on your weapon. And you know that the, the longer you hold that trigger, the more times you press it and, you know, die, motherfucker, die, die, motherfucker, die, the better chances and odds that you have of hitting your target. Right. So apply that same little mentality. And again, like, yeah, you have suppressive fires for the people that want to like nitpick it. Like, oh, you have an automatic weapon for suppressive fires so you can fire a maneuver. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that, dickhead. But the moral of the story is, the more people that you, the more people you make contact with, the better odds you have to learn. Mm. And that should be your mission. I just want to learn. I want to create a dialogue with you. I don't know what you have to offer me until I say, hi, my name is Greg. What's yours? What do you do? Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Your a door opens. That and asking. Marines and vets, like I had a hard time asking for something because I feel like I'm intruding. I'm like, oh, well, you're probably busy. And this is kind of like my own personal problem of like, I shouldn't ask for something because like that makes me feel like I can't do it on my own, Mm -hmm. which is so dumb because we know in the military you are you're nothing by yourself. Right. The army is like, oh, army of one, which is like so fucking wrong. Oh man, it's like, oh, there's a bunch of us. You're like (laughs) preaching to the choir there, man. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But it's you need to talk to people. You need I need help. But you you, just just that. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, man. And this is the thing that just blows that boggles my mind, and I'm guilty of it as well. You spend the entire time in the military doing everything together as a team, a battle buddy, a fire team, right? All of these titles in the military are structured around, you know, something other than individualism. And then everybody just comes to terms with that in the military and they just accept it and they know that they don't do anything by themselves. And then you get out of the military. For some reason, we all think that we should be able to be successful on our own. And we try to do everything on our own and then we fail and we fail and we fail. We finally realize, Oh shit, guess what? I can't do this on my own. I do need help. But why Mm -hmm. is it that veterans are okay with knowing that they can't do it on their own when they're in, but when they get out, that's all they try to do at first. Why is that? Um, I think that we need to remove the veteran part of that question because a lot of what I found is it's, a lot of what I've discovered in my market research and talking to people is when, when you put veteran on something, you're putting an expectation on it. Uh-huh. You're thinking that a veteran is different than any other 19, 20, 21, 23 year old dickhead out there and that they're the same person. They are a human being with natural consuming habits, natural habits in general, personality disorders, all that. Right. So I don't think it's just veterans. I think it's, um, I think it's a human issue hmm. that a majority of people want to, you know, I, I can do this. Like, oh, I graduated college. You know, I can do this. You know, mm-hmm. I, I work this job. That's fine. I was raised by a single mom. You know, I can do this. I help raise my fucking siblings. You know, I can do this. Everybody wants to be that that hero. Everybody wants to be that. Hey, you know, I, I did this on my own. 
because it's like a pride issue. And, right. and when you accomplish something on your own, it's like, fuck yeah. Right. But people forget about how great it feels to be on a winning team. Yeah, man. Because it's awesome to fucking give a high five to another person because that – if you do it on your own, you're just kind of like looking around. It's like, oh, shit, this is stupid. Like I've traveled the world by myself for work. Yeah. Led me to extremely austere locations and really cool locations. But I was always by myself. Yeah. And that's when I kind of figured out, like, this isn't fun doing this shit by myself. It took all the glory away from it because there was no one there to go, fuck, yeah, we did it. Right. Yeah, man. How did you get into creating an online application victor app is the is the app that you're currently building yeah, we're in development mm -hmm. so like where was this like where was the birthplace of this app like where did it you know how how did it come to be and where are you at with it so it kind of i mean i've been identifying things in my transition from like when i got out i use it when i tell stories or i tell jokes um and i was like I, it's stuff that's been going on and about two years ago, two and a half years ago, when I was between contracts, I was here in Chicago and I was at a barbecue with one of my buddies. And I was like, dude, like I'm sitting at my apartment by myself. Like, I don't know who's around me that can hang out, who's not working right now, who wants to go to a movie, get a bite to eat, go for a bike ride. I didn't know. Like, there was no platform for it. So I had like this crazy idea. Like, what if you could just like let people know that are around you, like that you're like available to like hang out or whatever. And I'm like, okay, that sounds cool. But then over time, I kind of like ended up, you know, I'm like, I don't know how to execute this idea. It's a cool idea. Everybody has ideas. Fine. But it wasn't until I met that panel of veteran entrepreneurs that I was like, fuck, like a problem. Right. So they had a problem that they're solving and in business. It's like, all right, well, what pain are you solving? What problem are you solving? Why mm -hmm. do people want to use this? And I was like, oh, I have a problem. <laughs> I, I have a bunch of problems I identified. So I started putting together the three things that I've identified that are really important to what I seen and people that I've talked to is in being successful in your life after service is that you need to have a sense of community. You need to have a network of people within that community, whether it's businesses that support you, organizations, individuals, volunteer opportunities, but you also need the health and wellness side of things. You need to have a workout buddy. You need to have a therapist if you can find one. You need to know where you can get healthcare services if you're not around a VA or a VA hospital or you don't have VA health benefits anymore. But you also need to have job services. You need to know. You need to have a mentor. You need to know what businesses around you that that want to hire you to be that candidate to help support their ranks because they know how qualified you are. So we kind of put that all under one central platform because, like, I have a background in uh, on the private side of doing intelligence analyst work, and like you need to have you need to have that network. You need to have. I just realized like there's a bunch of stuff that you need to do this. Yeah, so we we wanted to bring it all together, and was, you know, back to the, the intelligence work. You're, I'm constantly crawling through websites and portals and backdoor websites, not the cool kind that you look at by yourself, but like, <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> but like you're just like crawling through the internet trying to find one target, and it's like, fuck, man. Like, I get I get frustrated or overwhelmed. It's like, all right, dead end. And it's like, well, maybe you're maybe you were just like one click away from finding that target. Yeah, and. When I'm trying to find veteran services, whether it's a veteran discount or a veteran hiring fair near me or an organization that wants to help me out, it's really hard to find. And partially because of probably the, search, the SEO behind it. Yeah. But then because there's so many organizations that are trying to get a piece of that pie. Yeah. And if you're not well versed with crawling through the Internet, it's going to be really difficult for you to find those targets. Yep. So I'm like, why don't we put it all under one roof and we drive traffic to the to the, the most frequented things not as a veteran, but as a everyday consumer. Yeah. So if we can show you where to get a bite to eat, most people go out to eat maybe a couple times a week. You might take a date out once every you know other week or once a week. So those are the things that people utilize most. So how about we show the veterans where they can do those things in their community? Because if we can drive traffic to those high value those HVTs, those high value targets, we can then incorporate things like Marine for Life or Warrior for Life or the the, you know, the many, the multitude of services that the DOD and the VA offer that people don't fucking know about because they don't know where to find it. Yeah. They're like so, hiding in all these places. So paint, let's, let's do a little verbal artistic work here on our canvas. Paint me a picture. Tell me a story of, let's call him Joe, Joe, the, 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 the new veteran that just separated from, from the core uh, he stumbles across or he hears about Victor app. This is in the future once it's once it's released and available to the masses, right? So he whips mm -hmm. out his smartphone, whether it's a Android, a 
you know, uh, iPhone, whatever the case may be, pulls out his smartphone, he downloads Victor app on his phone and just walk us through like the different types of things that this, this, what, what name did I give him again? I forget already. I don't know. He's not very important. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> New let's, guy. Let's call him, let's call him boot, right? No, let's Boots. call him, let's call him Johnny, 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 Johnny on the spot. Right? right. So, so Johnny gets out of the core and he's got your app, like kind of walk us through like a day in the life of Johnny with this app in his pocket. Right. So Johnny ideally would have been using this product before he gets his DD214. Ah, okay. Because he can still use it for um, – he, I mean, he, while well, he's still in, I mean, he's probably broke. He's probably a Lance Corporal or whatever, and he just doesn't have much money. So maybe he wants to know where he can get a bite to eat out in town, right? So he's going to be using Victor to navigate his local – you know, not the base, but the services and you know, the community outside of you know, the front gates – for those discounts, those specials, those net, either networking events or meetups or hangouts, or maybe a, a local paintballing place wants to offer a free veteran paintballing event. Mm-hmm. Well, he can find those things before he gets out because when he gets out and getting close to getting out, he's going to be, he's going to have that same tool in his hand to, to navigate, to find his next city. And ideally what we want you to do is you give us your, the industries you're looking to get into the geographical locations that you'd like to move to based on like, if, you know, if you, if you want to be near water, for, you know, fresh water or whatever in the Midwest, like Chicago might pop up or Milwaukee or maybe St. Louis or whatever the fuck it might be. But we recommend to you five cities based on what you're looking for that you can start navigating before you even get to those locations. So basically what you're doing is you're doing your reconnaissance before you even have to, you know, get fucking kicked off base by PMO and you're like, all right, see you later. Yeah. So you, you have, you have a plan, right? Instead of sitting on the internet, you know, as a fucking 21, 22 year old kid and like trying not to look at porn for fucking 30 minutes, you're going to be, you're going to have it right in your hand. It's going to tell you, Hey, look at these five cities, start navigating them. You can find out how many veterans are in those communities in that city, what they offer based on what their profile is, how many nonprofits are in the area the volunteer opportunities, the housing, the housing opportunities. Maybe you want to find another veteran who's going from you know, Pensacola, and he also wants to go to Chicago, but it's too expensive to move on his own. And you want to go to Chicago. So you can find each other on the housing section. So now you have a roommate before you move. Mm. Maybe we introduce to you low income housing based on you being on unemployment when you get in, when you get out and you're not going to be making 35 K a year. So you're going to qualify for the low income housing here in Chicago, which are usually pretty nice places. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how the idea works of, we want you to have a tool that I didn't have that a lot of my brothers and sisters didn't have when they got out to be able to navigate that shit, right. to find where that city is, to find where you – know, I went back to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, man. I got in a fucking a whole bunch of bad shit that I shouldn't have because I didn't have anybody. Right. My mom, my family, my friends, they're like, we didn't know what to tell you. We didn't know how to talk to you. Yep. I'm like, well, yeah, well, no shit. Like, I'm a goddamn war hero. But <laughs> they, they didn't know how to fucking deal with me, man. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't have someone that served with me that could have been like, hey, dude, you're fucking up. Right. Because we were all fucking up. Yep. But we were fucking up like independently and like making a joke out of it. Like, oh, yeah, well, I'm just fucked up too. Like, yeah, I'm fucked up too, bro. It's like, oh, cool. I guess I'm doing not- the same thing that we're supposed to, but you're not. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, man. But you're not. So this app, so it sounds to me like uh, the individual is actually building out a profile, putting in some data, some information. Uh, about themselves and then this app kind of helps curtail whatever it is you're looking for to to the app uh, data that's inputted is that right yeah yeah, pretty much i mean we're we're not uh, some people ask me like so are you helping people write resumes i'm like no there's like ten thousand fucking organizations that help you do that yeah that's that's actually you gotta stick with your wheelhouse that's what i do right exactly talk about wheelhouse i i do the resume writing as a matter of fact i created a it's called Seven Day Resume. I don't know if you've ever have ever heard of it, but if you can go to sevendayresume.com, and it's a email drip. Seven days. I walk you through anyone. It does not. It's not veteran centric. It's anyone that is interested in learning how to write their own resume. I spell. Uh-huh. I spell it all out there for you. And I, I created the course from the perspective of the hiring manager because I used to. I was a hiring manager. I hired and interviewed a lot of people, and that's one thing that a lot of these organizations will teach you is how to write a resume, but they always teach you from the perspective of the employee and they don't really get into the perspective of the hiring manager. Like, like 
a lot of people don't know what hiring managers are looking for. There's some very few core ideas that hiring managers are are looking for, regardless of industry, regardless of the position they're trying to fill. Um, but a lot of people don't talk about that, right? So um, like you said, it's your wheelhouse. I'm taking things that I'm experienced in and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sharing it and I'm linking up with people like you that are experienced in other things. And pers- before you know it, right, I think you said it best, your network is your net worth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to have all the answers to everything. You just have to have a network of the right people to be able to get you what, or at least point you in the right direction. Yeah, you need to have that nuclear family. It's like I know if my dad's a corporate pilot. If I ever want a fucking airfare going somewhere and know where to find the cheapest air, air flights, I can call my dad. Right. My mom worked at a salon for like 20 years. If I need to know who, to, how to book a fucking nail appointment or a tanning appointment, I know who I can call. I have friends that are lawyers and cops, and those are all people that I don't have to go to school for that. Right. I don't have to be well-versed in I just have to know I am my own platform for that success. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, turn yourself into a platform. You should know everybody. If you don't have a lawyer, a doctor, a PR person, you need to have everybody in your book, in sales especially. Yep. And that's one of the things a lot of vets don't understand. And I, I left a bad taste in my mouth when I got out when I was doing automotive sales because I was like, oh, this is fucking stupid. But at the end of the day, dude, anytime you're trying to pick up a girl, you're trying to you know get a date, you're trying to get a job, you're trying to talk to somebody on the street, you have to sell yourself before they're going to fucking listen to you. Yep. And yeah, if you're, that reminds yeah. me of a book that I read uh, by Grant Cardone called Sell or Be Sold. Have you ever heard of that? No. Oh, check it out, man. Grant Cardone, Sell or Be Sold. And that's basically what he's saying, too, is, is you know, he's because he's a salesman. And he says, you know, people tell him all the time, hey, Grant, you know, I'm not a salesman. He goes, you know what? Yes, you are. If, you, if you're trying to, you know, you're trying to book a conference room at your at your company or you're talking to your boss about wanting some days off or you're trying to convince your wife into letting you go hang out with the boys on Friday. I mean, you're you're always selling, man. You're either selling or you're being sold, one one or the other. Right. But it's always happening, whether you want it to or not. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to happen to you. You better know how to do it. Yeah, man. So really quick, oh my God, we're, we're running close out of time here. So when yeah. when do we think Victor App is going to launch? So right now we're running an Indiegogo campaign, uh, which I'm, I need to plug just because, you know, it's there, our revenue stream right now. We're doing a friend and family raise on the side, um, but I like to stick with – I like to you know diversify my my portfolio, so to speak. So we're raising $25,000 on the Indiegogo campaign, and we are at about $13,600 right now. Recently, we won a contest that Indiegogo and General Assembly put on where we um, – there were three startup companies from Indiegogo. That were selected for it, and we took 52% of the votes over three companies. So we pretty much destroyed the competition. Nice. Um, and we won $1,500 in flash funding from General Assembly, which is great, but it also gets a lot of credibility. Yeah. Um, um, so w- once we hit this goal, and we're looking to see a big push as we get closer to the end of the campaign, which ends on January 7th, because that we can give a little sense of urgency behind it, and you know that gets people on board. Like, oh shit, I forgot to donate. Let me kick him a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, but, so for, for people that aren't familiar with Indiegogo, can you kind of briefly describe yeah. oh, what that yeah, is? Oh, yeah, good idea. So Indiegogo is just like Kickstarter. It's just like GoFundMe. It's an online crowdfunding site where you don't gain equity as a company, but you have an opportunity to receive perks, whether they're a T-shirt, a, a, a patch, um, uh, an interview. Like we have um, the Silky running shorts with our logo on it, a T-shirt. We have a Victor PVC morale patch that you can put on your gear and then – we have an interview with me and, you know, if you're a business or you're a vet that wants to highlight their own personal brand, we can help you do that and put it up on our website. But what it is, is you're donating your money to be a part of the project, kind of like, hey, I helped do this. I helped build this and be a part of, you know, our company, mm. not in a monetary sense or an equity stake. But, hey, we're a part of this. Hey, in two years when we're doing great, I can go back on that list of people that helped out and start reaching back out and trying to give back to the community that's once supported me. Right. Um, so let's run the numbers again real quick. So you, your, your target goal is what? Is 25,000. We are, um, we are at $13,665 right now. Um, every little bit helps bring us closer. Um, we've seen donations range from $5 to a thousand dollars from some, uh, from some individuals, which has been pretty impressive. But, uh, so development stage, once we hit that 25,000, it'll take us about two to three months for the nerds to sit there and code out the whole platform. 
But within that time, we'll be focusing on developing, um, building out the data set here in the greater Chicago area, just because this is where I'm located and this, my network is here. And uh, we have Great Lakes Naval Station, which is right up the road, which is a great resource because it's a military training facility, which mm. allows us to get users on board while they're graduating or going through their training cycle. And then we can know where they're going afterwards and focus strategically on where we need to build our data set up next to be most effective. That's awesome. So, so everybody that's out there listening that wants to be a part of this, if you donate, regardless of the, the dollar value uh, towards that goal of 25,000, it's going to be used at least up front in the development stage, the code writing of both the platforms on iOS and Android. Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Yep. Then awesome. we'll put, you know, if you donate at $25 or more, we're going to put your name on our website that'll live there for, you know, as long as we're in business, hopefully a long time, but also we're going to link it to a social cause of your, of your choosing, whether it's a charity, a nonprofit, maybe it's your own personal brand or website. We're going to, we're, we want, you know, like you gave money yet, yeah, but we want you to be able to live on our website along with that cause, that social mission that you're aligning yourself with, whether it's our cause or whether it aligns with ours or not, that's you as an individual. I don't believe in censorship. I mean, it's like I, I fought for, you know, the First Amendment rights or whatever. You want to talk about whatever you want. You want to align yourself with whatever it is. That's cool. Right. And we want to help that. Yeah, yeah. So, folks, if you are interested and you want to give to uh, Victor app, head on over to changeyourpov.com forward slash Victor. That's V-I-C-T-O-R. Again, that's changeyourpov.com forward slash Victor. And that will take you straight over to his Indiegogo account where you can then donate there. Okay, so really quick, this is Attack Friday, and Attack yep. Again stands for actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge. And I asked you earlier today if you'd come on, be so kind to come on and share with us between three and five tips, tricks, or pieces of coachable knowledge or information that you think that veterans out there, whether they're currently serving and soon to be veterans or are actively walking around with their DD-214 in hand, uh, what are some some things that you would recommend that would help them navigate their lives to be a better versions of themselves? Uh, yeah. So tip one would be let Bruce Springsteen sing about the glory days and leave that shit at the table. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that like one of the things I come across is like a lot of vets like, Oh, uh, well this time I did, you know, six years ago we we're on this patrol and like, you know, we got, we took an IED. It's like, okay, cool. Like I think that's okay to talk about, but, I find a lot of vets get into a social setting because they're so fucking lost in how to integrate into a social setting that they're not placed in that like any other human nature, you get uncomfortable and you talk about things that you know more than anybody else in the room because it gives you some sort of notoriety, I guess. So don't bring up things that don't, that are not relative to your surroundings. Mm. Have a joke or a, or, or a cool, not even say cool because that can be misconstrued. <laughs> Treat everybody that you meet with respect and have a plan to make them laugh. Kind of like General Mass, like, oh, have a plan, you know, treat everybody with respect but have a plan to kill them. Like, mm -hmm. you should have a plan to make everybody laugh around you. Right. If it's not funny or entertaining, leave it at the door. Leave it for the smoke pit with your buddies that were there with you. Yep. Um, other one would be don't be in – lose lose your, your ego at the door. You know, you're getting out. Unfortunately, yeah, you did some cool shit in the military, but people out the outside, they cannot fucking relate to it. So leave it. Go in with an open head. You should go in like a fucking sponge around everybody that you are and listen. Like the smartest people, and you have a good conversation with somebody and you walk away, you're like, damn, that guy was a great conversation. That guy said fucking like eight words, but you talk the whole time. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Be that guy that just listens. Like I've gathered intel on so many different people by just creating a baseline, right? You just listen. You listen. You're like, all right, cool. I'm listening. This is who you are. This is how you talk about. This is what you're interested in. Now's my opportunity. Here's who I am. This is what I do. So listen, you don't know everything. You actually are so far behind the curve when you get out. Just listen. Mm -hmm. Ask people questions. Literally ask people questions. Can you get me a job is a good question. But can you help me be a better person to an employer? Right. Who in your network can help me out with X, Y, and Z? I am looking to get into this industry. How can you help me? Right. Uh, and then your network, man, like you need to, the more people you have, like you should go to networking events and the more cards you have, the higher level you are in your fucking magic, the gathering game of life. <laughs> like so, look at business, 
it's, Go ahead. it's funny you say that because I, I recently gave a class um, to a group of student veterans at a local university here. And the, the workshop that I gave, now the, it was an hour-long workshop, and the title of it was Networking for Those That Hate Networking. And it was to teach these student veterans, you know, the basically networking 101, right? And But I, I totally expected a lot of these guys to show up at least semi-educated on the whole n- novelty of networking because literally – at, right after my hour long workshop we we walked through the doors of a restaurant and we met you know uh representatives of, of multiple uh companies and organizations in the local area that were looking to hire veterans so we actually went from the networking event to uh the networking workshop to a networking event is how it worked um and one of the first things i just kind of made the common uh statement assuming i was like so everybody's got their business cards right and everybody just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, okay, it kind of took me back a little bit. I was like, okay, raise your hand if you brought business cards with you. And the only one that raised his hand was that uh, lieutenant colonel after 22 years uh, <laughs> in the Army. He's the only one that raised his hand. And I'm like, are you, are, you're the only one. And I think there must have been probably 30, 40 guys. And only one raised his hand. And I'm like, you're going to go to a networking event without business cards. I'm like, okay, all right, fine. All right, you don't necessarily need a business card. Who brought a notebook and a pen in order to capture yes. information? Yes. And two it. people raised their hand. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, what are you guys planning on doing walking through those doors to an actual networking event if you've got no way of capturing information, no way of giving your information or writing anything down? I, I was beside myself. But then again, it goes back to I couldn't really – be mad at them because until the in, unless they've gone through, you know, unless they have a mentor that sat them down and gone through these things, or they've gone through a networking workshop like the one I was providing, like where else would we learn this stuff? They're not teaching it in the military. They're not teaching that uh-uh. in TAPS class, right? But so, the, the thing is that no taking gear, right? Like they did teach you that in the military. Right. You're right. They You're did. Always supposed to have a pen and paper. But see, when we get out. It's like, oh, things are different now. Like, right. that's a military thing. It's like, no, repurpose it. Yeah. If you're talking to right. someone at a networking event, if somebody's doing a keynote speaker, whatever they are, name, title, organization they're with, in an email address or social account handle that you can put down, and what they do. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, once you start getting to the point where it's like, fuck, I got this notebook that's just full of fucking names and information, <laughs> you can monetize that. Yeah. Because you're going to get to a point where you can start connecting the dots. Right. And you're going to talk to a veteran that's two years younger than you and go, hey, man check this book out. This is the kind of book that you need. And I'm going to help you take these numbers down, take these information down and go forth and do great things. But it's just, we get out and we think that like the world's going to be different or like the, you know, the world owes us something. And it's like, no dude, no one. I bet those guys went there with no business cards or no taking gear because they figured that someone's going to hand them something. Exactly. That we're used to just getting fish instead of being taught how to fish because you know, when we're in the military, it's like, you're the best, you're the greatest people are going to fucking suck your dick. They, they love you. It's like, well, no, <laughs> no. You have to give people a reason to yeah, do that. Yeah, you have right. to sell yourself. Loved it, man. Great conversation, uh, Greg. I look forward to working with you and and uh, keeping up to 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 speed and and keeping tabs on everything you got going on with the Victor app. And of course, I'm planning on having you on the show again. I would like to get you on oh, here after to. we've launched it and kind of talk about how things are going, how people can get involved. But in the meantime, <laughs> folks, you want to donate. I highly encourage you to do so uh, to help get this awesome platform up off the ground. You can head on over to changerpov.com forward slash Victor. And the three pieces of information, just to recap here, is, you know, hey, you know, leave leave the shit at the door, right? I mean, yep. leave leave the smoke, the smoke pit shit for the smoke pit and for the with the guys that you that you served with and try to come up with something other than. You know the the five dead guys that you you yeah, whacked over you know, there. You pull the, yeah, you pulled. Yeah, leave that away, man. Yeah. Like talk about like tell me a funny story about like you were giving a guy an IV because you're talking to a nurse or an EMT at a networking event. You're like, dude, if I gave this guy an IV in training and then he fucking passed out because blood went everywhere. I guarantee one of those guys will go, oh yeah, dude, uh, yeah, that happened to us all the time. So what kind of training do you have? You got to give people a reason that's relative for them to bite on, right? Yep. It's like trying to pick up a, a girl or a guy at the bar, right? Give them you, you listen, and that's the listening skill. You listen, you listen, you listen until you, you you wait for the opportune moment to pull the trigger and go. Okay, now I got you. Now I can. Now it's my turn to talk. 
It's about having a, a data bank of stories kind of cached away in your head, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, instead like, of having that one or two go-to mm -hmm. stories about, you know, how you were glassing some dude and took off his head right. with a 50 cal Beretta or, yeah. No, like you don't need to do that, but you got to have those those little things and they have to be relative. Right. And you will only be able to execute those little tasks by listening. Mm. Don't get uncomfortable. It. Be comfortable with sitting there. That's hard. And also, one of the other things, man, is you got to get out of your fucking comfort zone. Mm. Guys don't realize that. They go, well, I don't know. Like, how am I going to get to work? We're going to fucking walk, asshole. You humped 10, 20 miles before. Well, I don't want to go to that networking event. I don't know anybody. Or I go to some of these events and I see the same guys, like younger vets, and they sit at my table. I'm like, what the fuck? Get away from me. They're like, well, well, what's up? I already know you, asshole. You already know me. You're here to meet new people. Get out of your comfort zone because when you're out of your comfort zone, you're literally growing. Right. Because you'll look back and go, oh, that was hard, but this is easy now. That's yeah, right. idiot, because you just fucking like developed. You went on to the next training evolution. Yep. Number two is lose your ego. Keep it at the yeah. door. Open your mind up. Listen. Become a sponge. Ask questions. Number three is go to networking events as many as you can, and they may not be called networking events. They networking events conceal themselves in a number of things. Networking events can be town gatherings or you know you know, lunch after church or, I mean, you, anytime two or more people are gathered Dude. together, that's a networking event. You should consider or look at every opportunity as a networking event, walking through the mall, um, going to the movies with your kids. It doesn't matter what it is you do. If you're interacting with other people, particularly other people that you may not be familiar with or know very well, that is an opportunity to network. So you should always be prepared to, you know, open that hand up, stick it out and say, hey, how you doing? My name is... And yep. spark up a conversation and listen. And number four is get out of your comfort zone because you're right. The only place you grow is on the edge, on the edge of uh, being uncomfortable. No matter what it is in your life, you know, asking your wife to marry you, you were probably nervous, <laughs> right? You know, uh, going into yeah. to have to give birth to your to your children that day, you're probably very nervous. Going to the job interview, you're probably nervous. Like anything that that's good in your life is usually always predicated or preceded by a moment in life when you were very uncomfortable, right? Yes, sir. So I like it, man. I dig it. I love those four very actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge. Greg, hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I really look forward to getting to know uh, you a lot more as we go forward. Where's the best place that someone can connect with you and get to know more about what it is you do? Uh, the best place would probably be um, probably be LinkedIn. You can search Gregory Jooms. I'm the probably the only handsome um, gentleman up there who's also a founder of Victor App LLC. Um, or you can check us out on our webpage, VictorApp.io, and you'll see some media on us. But uh, the best possible way to learn about myself would be my LinkedIn page. I'm more, I, I welcome all of your listeners to find me on LinkedIn, connect with me, and help me grow my network, and I can help you grow yours. Very cool. Very good. And I will definitely do that. And all the links for that will be in the show notes for this episode by heading over to changeyourpov.com forward slash episode 137. Never miss an episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We have a lot more great content headed your way. Come be a part of our community over at Change Your POV Squad Facebook group. All right, folks. Until next time. Well, there you have it. Another episode of Attack Friday. Actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge just for you. Listen, the New Year's is just around the corner, and I wanted to remind everyone about our book club. For those of you that are just hearing about it for the first time, Ben and I have created a monthly book club. It's all free. We will be picking a book, and we will be talking about it, chatting about it on a special closed Facebook group. We'll be having special podcast episodes around that book. And you can find more by heading over to changeyourpov.com forward slash book club. It's all free and it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. January's book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Join us.